main concert hall uh, are these words from the American composer uh, Aaron Copeland. And uh, he said, so long as the human spirit thrives on this planet, music in some living form will accompany and sustain it and give it expressive meaning. And perhaps it's worth remembering that in regulating the social economy in all of its manifestations, we hold the future of the human spirit in our hands. The youngest people, our children, don't plan the social economy. It falls to the older people, the older generations, to do that. And let's remember that in doing that, we hold something fragile and precious and worth preserving and promoting for our children uh, and theirs. These reflections are necessarily personal, A, because I haven't been able to go to all of the sessions. The ones I've been to have been absolutely fantastic. So clearly there's a little bit of bias in there because it's the sessions I was particularly interested in. And also because everything is sort of refracted through the prism of my consciousness and my experience as an English lawyer visiting this wonderful land, this wonderful uh, city. So these are personal reflections. And uh, of course, you'll take from them uh, what you can, what you find valuable uh, in them. We had a wonderful discussion um, on the very first day at the Academy about what we're talking about when we're talking about the nighttime economy. Because sometimes, uh, this, I think this expression, nighttime economy, came out of discussions um, at the beginning of the millennium. But it's become quite a loaded concept. It's got negative connotations. When you say nighttime economy, people think, oh, this is all about alcohol and binge drinking and violence and so on. But just by, by flicking the word, by changing the emphasis, you can completely change people's approach and attitude to what it is that we're trying to regulate and promote. Instead of nighttime economy, what about evening and nighttime economy? Why are we excluding people who like to go out in the early evening and be in bed with their cocoa by 10 o'clock? What's the matter with that? Why don't we call it the social economy? Um, because some of the things people like doing at night, they like, do, like doing during the day. I saw a ping pong bar here, just round the corner. Well, why are we only talking about that at night? We're talking about the same people, the same customers, the same workforce. Why not talk about nighttime ecology? Why are we only talking dollars and cents? Why aren't we talking about how a nurse gets home from the hospital? How a call center worker gets home? Uh, whether somebody feels safe walking their dog at 10 or 11 at 12 at night, whether transit workers feel safe, whether, whether people can feel safe using transport systems. All of this is about not the economy, it's about ecology. It's the way we interact with each other and with our environment late at night. Sometimes we talk about, and we coined this phrase in, in London when we wrote a report for the mayor, we talked about what happens from six till six, six at night till six in the morning. Anything which goes on there is a legitimate game for our scrutiny and for our research and for our, our care and our tenderness in making sure that it's managed for the benefit of all. And sometimes just by, you can change the word just a little bit, nightlife might just become life at night. People just like being around at night. It's not necessarily nightlife, they're just around, and we should think about their needs as well as the needs just of customers. So think what term works for you in your town, your city, your county, to describe this, this phenomenon in a positive way. And why do this? Why can't we just say, well, look, we've got Netflix now, we've got Uber Eats, we've got Deliveroo, uh, we don't need to leave our homes, we can smoke on our own patios, we can have our friends round and watch the soccer, or NFL, or UFC, whatever it is you're, you're into. Why can't we just do that? Why is it worth preserving? Why is it worth everybody convening here and having a conversation about how to do this well? And what, a lot of what I hear when I come to cities, Seattle is one of them, is that having a great social economy is one of the key reasons why people choose to live, work, and invest in a place. Show me a successful city, I will show you a successful social economy. That's why people want to move there. Another reason is that a diversely populated street is a safe street. Uh, if you can think of streets with nobody on them at the middle of the night and they feel unsafe, you feel unsafe, I feel unsafe, my children feel unsafe, get a, a wonderful mix of people in the street late at night, it becomes a safe street whether there's uh, sufficient police resources to station a uniformed officer there or not. 
One of my feelings is that we're in, in an increasingly globalised world and money flows all over the place. I can ent entertain myself in the comfort of my own living room, but the money is flowing to some other country, to British Virgin Islands, if I'm into gambling, uh, or to another country altogether if I'm buying product. Uh, and taxes might not be paid in the, in the country, let alone the city of origin. So can we get to a world where money earned in a city stays in a city, where local customers are enjoying entertainment provided by local providers with local workers supporting a local economy and an indigenous culture? That feels to me like a really worthwhile thing to do in this increasingly globalised, networked world. Uh, and another important point is that the social economy underpins the creativity and connectedness of humankind. If you didn't have music venues, if you didn't have little bars, if you didn't have places to play, would there ever have been a Kurt Cobain? Would there ever have been a Jimi Hendrix? In my city, there would never have been. There would never have been Rolling Stones. There'd never have been a David Bowie, unless there'd been a thriving culture of music venues and the connectedness, the ability for artists to practice what they do and find an audience. So we need to provide for that. It underpins our civilization. And the alternative to that, and I know we're increasingly entertaining ourselves from our home. We're getting things delivered to our house rather than visiting our local high street. Fine, that's going on. We're not going to stop it happening altogether. But if it goes too far and we lose the vibrancy of our town centres, we lose the shops, we lose the social the the, uh, the, uh, the, the services, we lose the uh, alcohol economy, we lose food and beverage, we lose activity. So everything which is happening is happening in people's homes. To me, that feels like desolate and desiccated vision of society. So I think when talking about not just the social economy, we're talking about the way we get on as a human race. So this is worth doing, in my view. But how should we plan it? Well, luckily, we've got Jim's again. I jokingly call Jim John the Baptist, because until you've come within the presence of Jim and he's anointed you, you're, you're really not qualified to plan your own nighttime economy. So if you don't mind me uh, calling him John the Baptist, I'm sure he doesn't mind. But he's laid out a really fantastic process. And what you get here, we've heard from New York, we've heard from San Francisco, we've heard from Washington, D.C., but we've heard from you know, Montgomery, we've heard from the much smaller places within the society... The, the, but the methodology is the same. The building blocks are the same. The techniques are the same. How they're applied in your individual locality is always a matter of local preference, local choice, local analysis. But what's so fantastic about the RHI, and the reason that I want to come here, is that you get the thinking, the underlying thinking behind it. How do you go about doing this? What would the disciplines be? How would you make sure that you're doing this in a correct way? And this is the great beauty of conventions such as this and, and the RHI in laying out a, a navigable road, a navigable path uh, for you to travel down if you want to get your social economy right in your town or city. So here are Jim's four building blocks, and you can find them all over the literature or listen to Jim and uh, his colleagues. Nowadays, of course, there are major threats to the social economy. If you ask a nightclub owner, well, what do you compete with? Ten years ago, they might say, well, we compete with pubs, basically. But nowadays, in my country, they'll say we compete with everything. You've got to get people out of their homes first. My daughter talks to, not about pre-loading or pre-drinking. It's, it's so entrenched. They just talk about pre's. Oh, well, we had some pre's from 10 till 1, and then we popped out into the nighttime economy, and maybe we had one drink, if we can get away with it at the nightclubs. You're only spending three pounds, and that's their night out. That is big competition for uh, the nighttime industries. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do to bring people back in? And it was quite interesting. I did a piece on this, and Alicia did a fantastic piece on this, completely independently, and we, we came basically to the same conclusions, which are that you've got to work extremely hard to get the consumer back into the nighttime economy. A, because there's, sometimes it's not as safe, sometimes it's not as convenient, they've got to work how to get home, and there's a cost attached to that, so they'll entertain themselves at home. And it's, I think as VR takes off, there'll be even more of that at home. People will be creating virtual nightclubs in their own living rooms. So there's going to be real competition, it's not going to get less. So we talked a bit about some of the things which uh, operators have got to do to make sure that they can uh, attract people back. And so we've, we've talked about competitive socialising, everything from axe throwing to table tennis to petonk indoors. To, I went to an extraordinary place here where customers were coming in and doing social gaming 
online and there was uh, basketball stuff going on. Kids were rushing around the place. There was more sort of adult-oriented entertainment and so forth, all in the same place. This is, this is evidence of the nighttime operators fighting back. You've got to create Instagrammable moments. It's not enough to provide a bar. You've got to be able to uh, ensure that people can take a picture of themselves and send it to their friends to invoke jealousy in their friends, that their friends aren't there, and, and they are. You've got to premiumize. It's not enough to say, all right, well, gin and tonic, fine, ice with that. No, which of the 30 gins would you like? Which of the 10 tonics? And which, you know, do you want dry ice with that, or do you want just ordinary ice, and so forth? So that's all part of what operators have got to do to make their place the special place. You've got to curate. And I think curation operates both ways. It's operators curating. It's operators saying, what is, what is it that I can do to enhance this experience by reference to the location, the lighting, the staffing, the hospitality, to make an individualized experience for the customer? But then customers want to curate their own experience. The customer is now the boss. The, uh, the customer is no longer a sort of passive recipient of services. The customer wants to say, well, I've curated that because I created the unique cocktail. In, or I went to that room and then that room and then that room in the nightclub and finished up at this incredible venue. So they really want to have a sense of, and then Instagram themselves while doing it, they want, they want to design their own night. And so you've got to provide the opportunity to do that. And you've got to maximise your unique locations. Rendezvous last night was a unique location. You know, an old speakeasy. That's the kind of unique location which drags people in and drags tourists in when you're visiting a city. That's what we're looking for. Um, Alicia did a, this isn't just an Alicia advert, but this is the second of three mentions she's getting. Um, she, did a, she did a fantastic session on how to attract women into the night economy, A, because it's a nice thing to do, and B, because women are the decision makers within the social economy. So if they're going to go, then uh, men will follow them. And she talked about many of the things that I was interested in. You can't just sell cheap booze. It doesn't work anymore. You've got to think of what all the other touches are which are going to attract a female audience. Primary uh, among those is, of course, safety. And that means not just safety of the club environment or the pub environment, but safety of the street. It's not going to provide the car park. Is the car park lit? Is the way to the club lit? Is it safe? Is there level access? Is there a sense of eyes on the street? Is there a broken window syndrome? Is there litter on the ground? You feel unsafe because there's graffiti. You've got to view the whole environment through women's eyes. And if you do that, then you're going to create an environment which men are likely um, to follow through. She had had an extended treatise on restroom designs, which was amazing. I mean, for me, it was absolutely wonderful to see all the things you could do in a restroom to make that female friendly. And it was a great piece, and uh, I, I very much appreciated hearing it. One of the things which has um, now developed into a main theme of these conferences, rather than just a curiosity, uh, is, the, is the idea of nightmares, night stars, if you think nightmare sounds too much like a nightmare, night stars, nighttime advocates, um, all of that topic. And so I think now we're getting into, Andrena's probably left, has she? But Andrena Sages has done a fantastic piece in this month's Urban Studies about this phenomenon of nightmares, where she interviewed about 40 of them and really got a, a fantastic perception about what works, um, what their experiences have been, what the impediments are, and so forth. It's really worth getting hold of that, uh, if you can. One of the big questions which has had to be answered is, where do you locate this job, inside or outside City Hall? Does it become part of the bureaucratic governmental structure, or does it operate independently as some kind of NGO or advocacy group headed up by the Knights are? Who is the ideal person for that? And you see different sorts of personalities People who've come out of business, sometimes people who've come out of a um, community, sometimes people who've come out of regulation. But the most important thing about this person uh, is that they are a champion of the nighttime economy who can mobilise support and buy in for that economy amongst uh, everybody involved. That's all stakeholders, residents, uh, the regulatory bodies, the operators, the workers, and so forth. And then there's a whole series of functions, which some of them won't exist in some offices, all of them will exist in some, but you'll have to work out what, what functions you want for your local area. I can't pontificate on this topic because what works for London won't necessarily work for Pittsburgh, won't necessarily work for Miami. 
So you've got to make your you've got to make your pick and start off with what are the functions, then you can work out where it's to be located and who is to fill this job. But it all it runs from advocacy for the nighttime economy to advice to management of. I mean, it could just be what we in England we just call a nighttime manager. It could be about education of all sorts of people, but including bar owners about what they should do. Um, to bring themselves into better compliance. Sometimes it's about mediation, everyone yelling at each other across a chasm, and the nighttime advocate can step in and say, well, now let's see what underlies this, and let's see what, what can bring you together. Sometimes it's about navigation. You get brilliant operators uh, in the nighttime space, but they don't know, they don't understand how planning and licensing and zoning and all these things work. And rather than shutting them down, which is kind of easy, you can help them navigate all the complexities of city halls. They play a sort of ombudsman role. Sometimes they regulate. In San Francisco, we heard from Jocelyn, she regulated as well as befriended. And that's a, quite an interesting, uh, it's not a dichotomy, but they're, 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 they're functions which could be brought into conflict if not handled sensitively, which I'm sure Jocelyn did. And of course, one of the most important things they can do is they can see the whole thing. They're not operators. They're not the mayor. They're not the parliament, but they can just see the whole landscape with all of its difficulties and all of its complexities, and they're able to bring the whole thing together in the way they advise all parties to this debate uh, how they can do it in a more respectful and helpful and positive manner. Um, but to what end? And I think it's, it's, really, it's, it's so easy, I think, for cities, oh, well, New York's got one. You know, we've got to have one. Why? There's no obligation to have a nightmare or a nighttime advocate. So what's the mission? What's the problem that you're trying to solve? And it may be as simple as, look, New York's got one because it's a global social economy and they want to say to the world, hey, you know, look at our night, sorry, our nightmare. It may be as simple as that. That's not an invalid reason to have somebody in post, to be a promoter uh, yeah. of the nighttime economy. But then other places might think, well, we're not that interested in sort of promoting tourism here. It's not one of our main industries. What we need is somebody who's much more at street level, making sure there's not double parking and the litter's picked up. That's valid. So not, don't let me tell you what the mission is. You analyse your situation and work out what the mission is and proceed accordingly. And I think we're now getting to the point where we can talk about the disciplines. And I found this really sort of helpful to see how intellectually... Um, different cities have gone about it and what the RHI is saying about it. So first of all, demonstrate this as an industry worth having, sort of accumulate your data about the direct and indirect benefits um, of your social economy. You're building effective teams, you're making sure that all stakeholders are represented. You're developing a structure which is an effective structure. You're using data to understand the issues. It's incredibly easy for the local press to say, oh, drinking is a big problem or Drug consumption is a big problem. Well, find out. You know, map it. And if you've mapped it, not only does that tell you how then to proceed, it then tells you whether the job you're doing is working. You know, if, the, if your problem is loss of LGBT venues, map that. What's happened in the last 10 years? What are we going to do about it? What part is the nightmare going to play in that? Measure it in five years' time. Have we, have we turned this trend uh, around? Um, I think it's wonderful to come to events like this, assemble best practice from around the globe. It's, it's really helpful to say, well, I can see this is what they did in Amsterdam. That was great. Why don't we borrow it? San Francisco invented agent of change. London stole it. And now it's in our national planning policy that if you're building something next to a music venue, you've got to build so that you're not then going to complain about the noise in the music venue. Brilliant idea, simple solution. Invented in San Francisco, came to London, would never have done had it not been for events like this. So this is, this is, a, this is a beautiful thing. I think a point uh, made by uh, Andrew Ridgey, which uh, impressed me from New York, was it's dead easy to fight against something. It's so easy to uh, just to be negative about something. But actually, be relentlessly positive. What are you for? What do you want? And then fight for that. It, it won't happen in sort of six months. Um, it, it might happen in 20 years. But fight for it. Keep it you know, as part of your goals. Uh, and uh, ensure that people can see that you're not just a sort of pugilist against the march of the modern world, but you actually want a, a, a better world, and you're prepared to fight for that. We had a fantastic talk from uh, a, a guy called Thomas Manger. Is he in the room? Um, no, a former police officer. I want to put him in my pocket and take him back to the UK. Because what he had to say um, about effective policing, I would just wish we could get our chief 
police officers across the UK to listen to it. But he talked about setting up a, an interagency public safety team. And it was all a lot of the same stuff as was being discussed in relation to nightmares, nighttime advocates, etc. Sharing data and technology, using best practice, problem solving, advising, educating, inspecting, and where necessary, enforcing. I think it's a bit like parenting, actually. I mean, I've never run a thing, I've got to confess. I've never run a club. Um, and I've never been actually a regulator. I advise regulators. But I, I have been a parent. And isn't what you do? You, you give your kids the maximum boundaries to run around in? But there are boundaries. And so if they step over the boundary, then eventually you might just have to regulate. I think the sort of policing the night time is a bit like that. You want the creatives to come forward. You want them to fall over and make mistakes because that's how they learn and that's how they get better. You want to give them a helping hand and pick them up. And then they may come over and say, look, that's not on. And I think that's good policing. And he talked about it. And I, I, thought, it was, I thought it was deeply impressive stuff. I love this terminology he used about doing with and not doing to. Um, so if you're having a multi-agency inspection, fine, have a multi-agency inspection, but tell the venue you know, that next month or next year you'll be having one, and these are the things we'll be looking for. And when you walk in, don't disrupt the venue, but do it in an orderly way, and then feedback about what has been found. It's not an, it's not an opportunity to catch somebody out and shut them down. It's an opportunity to help them um, improve. I liked his idea of a, of a risk-based approach, actually nominating the risks, and I like the idea that a, that a senior regulator should be a person, a people person, who can view the whole thing um, with empathy and exercise fairness, openness, and transparency. I thought it was a fantastically impressive session. Just, I think, probably almost a last word on nightmares and so on. There are risks in this post. I think it gets, it, it gets, it gets um, publicised and it's sort of emblazoned in publicity. We now have a nightmare. And then six months later, the press is likely to say, well, so what have they achieved? I mean, it's like appointing a sort of global climate czar and expecting, you know, climate change to be reversed in six months. It's not going to happen. This, this is complex. It's a complex world out there. So don't create, create false expectations. You've got to get across that this is a, a, a long-term um, position. It's a long-term job. You've got to secure political buy-in as much as doing the job. You've got to secure buy-in to what you're doing. You've got to be open and transparent with everybody. You've got to listen. In New York, we heard a lot about that, about traveling around, listening to people, and making them feel they've been listened to. There's a danger that you'll be seen as the sort of lapdog of the industry. Oh, well, they'll just do anything to keep the clubs open, and they're such a pain, etc. You've got to try and hold that uh, balance as best you can. And I think one of the best ways you can avoid criticisms of partiality is whoever the nightmare is, do what New York has done, and make sure that sitting behind it, there is an independent and diverse board so that you're able to say, look, all interests are represented. So I've learned a lot on that topic from, uh, coming, to this, um, from coming to this summit. Disappearing nightlife, to me, is a vast topic. You can regulate all you want, but if every year your nightlife is disappearing, I think that's worthy of scrutiny and, 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 and worthy uh, of our attention. And so I've just been logging everything I've heard about preserving nightlife and what authorities can do on that topic through this conference. And so here are some of them. So um, providing funds so venues can soundproof themselves. The whole process of legacy provision and all the policies which sit around that. I suggest you Google it um, in, in San Francisco. Um, it's a great page on what they've done to preserve their legacy premises. The idea of longer hours, you cut an hour off a venue, you can, you can take out half their profit. So if, if, if you can get longer hours, not so long that everyone's got to keep their venues open to compete with everybody else and they're not making money. I think there's a, there's a sort of curve, there's a sweet spot. Um, about hours, but you can think about longer hours. You can think about nighttime transport, not just for customers, but for performers who are not hugely well paid and they don't necessarily want to take an Uber home. They might not necessarily be able to afford it. How are you going to get these people to and from their places um, of performance? Promotion as a city. This is a great place to come. Social uh, marketing as a city, great place to come. The setting up of community trusts so that authorities buy buildings and then rent it out to new start businesses um, for small or peppercorn rents. It's a fan I can think of two major restaurant chains now who started off on, on that sort of model. Low rent, low rates, a four ring burner, turning out some pizzas, and now they're national chains. But give people a start, and I think that's part of the obligation um, of a city. 
and so on. And uh, just finally, the idea of protective designations um, of, um, of, of, of venues. So you're able to say, this may not be the opera house, but it was the pub where X happened, and it's historic for that sort of reason, to stop changes of use happening, to list that place as a place, place that was worthy of protection. I think this is a big topic, and I think that we, we should continue talking about it. The incubation of creativity, the, the, the soul of cities depends on their creativity. And I think it's partly about the bricks and mortar places where the arts can thrive. But I think it starts much earlier. In our country, we've become rather sort of formalistic in our education and, and education uh, creativity is being dampened down in schools. And I think that's really, really tragic. I think we should be promoting the arts in schools. They're the, they're the future of our civilization. They're the future of human spirit. I think we should be fostering programs for kids to engage in creative industries. In England, there's a wonderful, she was a very big um, electronic dance music DJ called DJ Lisa Lashes, um, and she just didn't want to tour anymore, and she set up this tiny little school for aspiring DJs in a very unpromising Midlands town. It's now got national recognition, and hundreds and hundreds of prospective DJs are finding their way into the British you know, music economy through attending Lisa's um, Lisa's programme. So, I mean, I think that's a wonderful thing. I think you look abroad to um, arts villages in Copenhagen and Vilnius, where there's a little bit of anything goes, artists are welcome, rents are, lo are low, and there's an opportunity for people to bounce off each other. So Google that and find out about that. The, the idea of support for small arts and music venues, it's not just the flagship places, it's the tiny little places on a shoestring. What can you do to support those venues? Support buskers. Just have music everywhere in a, in, a, in a town or a city. Think of cheap ticketing programs. How are kids going to get inspired unless they can get into performance cheaply? So get, bring your corporates together with your arts venues and make them support ticketing programs for school children and students. And most of all, mentor people coming into the night economy. Find out who your players are. Um, who've already been through the process, who are able to bring on the next generation. So I think that's a big, big topic. It's not just about regulation, but it's about incubation. And we heard quite a bit about that, of, of, about incubation in Seattle, which is how it succeeds in being such a staggering city, which has had a sort of disproportionate effect on the world through its creativity. There is an elephant in the room. So much I work in the law about licensing and regulation, and I don't think I'd have a job if customers just left clubs and behaved themselves and went home quietly. I mean, it's, you know, it's not that the venues are plying them with too much alcohol. It's just that people coming out of a noisy environment and they had a few drinks, said, oh, it's been great, lovely, yeah, see you tomorrow. Car on the radio, down the street, yeah, see you. Hooter. All of that, if people didn't do that, there'd be a lot less trouble um, in the nighttime economy, and there's, there's a, in England, certainly, there's a lot of sort of mixed-use areas in town, town and city centres where you've got clubs sitting next to residences and so on. And it's far more often about the behaviour of departing customers than it is. Well, how long have I got? Than it is about um, yeah, five minutes. Five minutes. Than it is <laughs> five minutes. You haven't even got your smiley face. Ha. Um, <laughs> It's a lot more about departing customers than it is about noise leakage from the premises. And so I think the venue should think a lot about winding down policies, turn the music down, turn the lights up. Look, we're going to shut in half an hour. Do you want to pop to the toilet? Um, get your coat. Say goodbyes here. Please remember there's people opposite, door staff, you know, prompting people uh, to be quiet. So I think that's a, a really important component of it. I think the idea that street security... It doesn't stop at the door, but they take a little bit of ownership of the frontage. They're able to say to people, look, mate, hey, really sorry, but can you see there's people trying to get to sleep opposite? I think that's really effective. I think having um, transport to swish people away, where the taxi ranks are, are, are where the street, where the buses go, do they go at night, etc. I think is really important. I think the whole concept of nudge, I don't know if this is just a British concept, but the idea that you can reinforce and promote positive behaviours is really good and we heard from is it we heard from a wonderful guy from Victoria is he Victoria BC is he, is he still here um, who, yeah and he talked about how they're trying to reinforce good behaviours uh, on this topic just signs saying sweet dreams are made of this or give peace a chance and so on to just remind people that they should actually shut the F up um, 
I, I, just taking that, um, we heard from Mickey, who I, I think made us sort of step back and think more conceptually about regulation, not just, oh, here's the problem, solve it. And I just want to take her approach to, to public urination. So the sort of level one approach is, look, people are peeing on, in the street, let's stop them. And I've certainly got clients who put in high lighting, CCTV along the alleys with splashback paint and all of that sort of stuff. So that's step one. That's, you know, that's, that's just let's stop them doing it. Step two is, well, let's provide for them. If they need to have a wee right there and then, let's, let's make some provision. To be honest, I, I loathe it. I loathe walking through London and seeing sort of pissoirs. But they are there and they collect an awful lot of urine, which would otherwise end up on people's doorsteps. But what about level three? This is where you don't see the candle as a candle, but as a resource with string in it, um, is that customers decide not to foul the streets. Can we imagine a society where individual people say, well, when I go to someone's house, I'm not peeing on their sofa. So, you know, why am I peeing in the street? What the hell is going on? And I think in England, I used to go to football games, you know, soccer games, and people used to pee on the terraces. It would flow down, you know, past your feet. You know, so that's, that's how it was. And people say, oh, it'll always be like that. Football will always be like that. Why are we so unambitious? You know, <laughs> why can't we change? And in England, this is only 1950, when we were having a resurgence of TB, and the government said, well, let's stop people spitting in the street. Well, nowadays, spitting in the street in the UK is really uncommon. It would just be viewed as disgusting. So why is it that urination is viewed as OK? Why is it that yelling and the someone's bedroom window is viewed as okay. I think this deserves some proper research and some, some proper work to see if we can improve people's behaviours. Final thoughts, two final slides. We, um, I love coming to the Responsible Hospitality Institute. And when we're here, we tend to talk about responsibility. So that's what, it's the, it's the, it's the verb that gets the, uh, that gets the attention. I think it was James Thurber that said, there's no noun that can't be verbed. Um, but I, I think you can't really verb hospitality. It would be something like hospitalise or something. It doesn't really work. I'd like, just like to focus on hospitality. Because the, the notion of hospitality implies something. If somebody comes to my home and they can't eat meat, I don't give them meat. If, they, if they're allergic to nuts, then I'm taking care over that. If, they're not, if, they're, if they are blind, then I'm solicitous of that. So there's a whole series of things which flow from the notion of hospitality, but it's two ways on. Where somebody comes into my home, I'm inviting them to sit on my sofa, I'm not inviting them to stand on my cat or to slide down the banisters. I mean, so it, it connotes a sort of reciprocal obligations one way or the other way. So I think that we should spend a lot of time focusing on what it is to be hospitable, what expectations that, uh, that creates in people. And so I think it's about welcoming people into safe, interesting environments, taking care of them, diverting them, and attending to their needs, including special needs. And there was a fantastic session this morning with Greg DeShields and Alicia, again, third mention, and, and John Samuel, where they said this thing, which was my big takeaway from the thing, which is that um, diversity um, is inviting people to the dance. And inclusion is inviting them um, to dance. And equity is involving them in picking the music. So, and I thought that was a fantastic discussion. I also was a, well, you had a wonderful discussion about how um, diversity happens through things like door policies. So you could run a door policy which ended up being discriminatory. And we got to a point, I can't remember who it was who made the intervention, I thought it was a fantastic intervention, so shout out for this person I can't see in the room. She said, well, look, you can have a door policy, which is about door code, but to avoid, avoid it being discriminatory, you've got to apply it in an absolutely even-handed way. And otherwise, you risk discrimination. So that's the responsibility of the management. But to me, that is an aspect about responsible hospitality, which is the welcoming of people in whoever they happen to be and whatever their needs happen to be. So that, I thought, was one of the key, for me, was one of the key <coughs> sessions um, from, the, from the whole thing. And this is my last slide, and it's my takeaway. It's a, I haven't said this to anyone. You're the first that I've said this to. I try things out of my kids, but just you're the first audience. It's, it's the idea of an ethical social economy. Um, so the social economy is where we express and delight in our common humanity, whether we're celebrating, commiserating, dancing, necking, chatting, enjoying the food, whatever it happens to be. So if that's right, 
It should be a place of ethical practice. For example, it should be tolerant. It should be diverse. There should be respect for everybody, going both ways. It should be sustainable. Uh, it should be safe. And there should be working conditions which work for everybody. In England, we've got a big issue about whether the waiters get their waitresses get their tips or whether it just goes into the profits of the business, that sort of thing. Are we thinking about how workers get home uh, at the end of the night? Are we protecting them from assault and so on and so forth? So I like the idea that we're inviting our, our children into this space, and it's an ethical space. Uh, they're, they're getting some of this online, but perhaps not much, and then maybe they're not getting it right from their schools. But let's demonstrate, let's model something. Um, and I, I think that this is an increasingly atomized society, um, and it's ever more important that where we commune, we model a good society for those who follow us and for those who follow them. So I've had a great time. I've been a bit sleepless in Seattle. I'm still jet-lagged, and now I'm, now I'm going home. Thank you to Seattle. Thank you to the RHI. Thank you.